Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. Uh, today we have basic contract law for project managers, and this is part one of a three-part series. We've got Sarah Schutt with us today. Uh, she's a member of the APM Contracts and Procurement SIG, and she'll be our speaker. So she, without any further ado, I'll hand over to you now, Sarah. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Sarah, and really happy to be here today. As Sarah says, I'm part of the group contract and procurement team. Uh, I'm a lawyer by trade. I work for myself, have done so since 2014. Um, there is a bio attached to this um, webinar, so I'm not going to spend time uh, telling you any more about me, except that I advise on and observe project managers at work every day. Um, it's what I specialize in, uh, specifically within the construction, engineering and infrastructure sector. Um, and when we ran this series of webinars um, originally, which was back in 2018, um, they proved really popular. And I have observed since then the job of the project managers, the roles and responsibilities that you all have, as becoming more and more demanding. And you may well have seen uh, various surveys over the past couple of years indicating that the world is becoming more projectized. So there are more projects being uh, done within companies and also being bought and sold by companies. And so the role of the project manager is um, becoming more demanding. It requires an additional set of skills. And in order to become one of those superlative project managers and therefore in demand from employers, we at um, the Contract and Procurement SIG decided, uh, and I was re-volunteered, uh, to run this series again. So I've updated it and refreshed it a bit. So if you've joined us in our original 2018 series, that's great. I hope you'll hear some new, fresh and energetic things about the world of contracts for project managers. And if you're joining us for the first time, then contracts are all about enabling the project managers to be leaders, and to be more business oriented in what they do. And that's what this series of webinars is going to focus on. So um, without uh, any further uh, delay, let me move forward. So what we're gonna look at in this webinar today is how do we make a contract? Um, there's five components to it, we'll look at them all. Um, we'll also touch on letters of intent. We'll look at an express terms of contract and implied terms of contract. We will look at what freedom of contract is all about under UK law and the boundaries which are imposed on all of us and on organisations. Finally, we'll look at special contracts and if you get to the end, you will be rewarded with an hour of CPD points through APM. So our mission here at Shooter Consulting Limited is that we make law work for the construction and engineering industry. And what that means is that my belief in setting up this company and its success is centered around the reality of using law in practice. Now that comes from over a decade of being a senior counsel in engineering companies uh, in the private sector and also in the client side in the public sector. So I've got a pretty well-rounded um, set of field experience. And applying that law to projects um, as it delivers uh, as it progresses, as the benefits are realized to that project is really what this is all about. So the kind of um, pressures that I commonly see on project managers are these sorts of things coming up on the slides now. You are the central piece to the project. You are what makes the project move forward. You are what unsticks the sticky bits of the project as well. And that requires you to have a broad skill set as a project manager not just the technical stuff, um, not just the, the agile and the waterfall and the blended and these other um, different methodologies that are available, but also as someone who has to lead people, someone who perhaps has to deal with money, uh, someone perhaps who has to look at plans and drawings and things like that. And of course, you'll have people around you who you can delegate some of that stuff to, who are real experts in those technical areas. But this broad skill set does lend itself very well to a quality project manager. The fact of your centrality means that others are dependent upon you, dependent for direction, for instruction, for approval, 
for support and for other areas of um, project realization and therefore this can be quite a pressure for project managers as well so you might be thinking well what does this all mean for me in terms of contracts well it's a really um a twofold thing because of course being that central person having that dependency by others in projects means that your uh, centrality goes to project success however that is defined whatever that's going to mean um, and, and however people are going to um, give it the sticker of success once it gets to the end but there are other risks as well to not learning about contracts and those are really to you and the work that you can do and also to any organization that employs you so I want to look at it from a twofold application as well uh, now you'd expect me to say this as a lawyer to uh, suggest to people that they take legal advice but this is on the basis of the idea of these webinars is not to turn you into contract experts that's not going to happen in three hours um, what you are going to get over this series of webinars is some really good basics um, i'm also going to introduce you to where the limitations of that knowledge can be within this time frame uh, and therefore where you might go to uh, seek further help. So foundations for learning for project managers are these. I hope these will resonate with you well. So as project managers, we deal with contracts every day, but what is a contract? We deal with relationships that look like contracts, but may not be. We're asked to work with others, and therefore there's some sort of an arrangement and that may or may not be a contract. The thread through all of these three points of the relations that we have that may or may not be contract is that we have risk, and we have risk where there's uncertainty, and there's uncertainty where you don't know what the parameters of the relationship are. Being at risk means fragility, fragility to project success, project success being typically measured by how much the project is costing, uh, how long it's taking and whether it is uh, on time. Success is measured by the quality of the work which is done and the services that are rendered. And also then the reputation of those who are working on the project. And if we have fragility around those items, one or more of them, then the uncertainty in that relationship drives us to need to learn more about contracts in our work as project managers. So my aim through this series is to enable you to have some tools to do your job better. So let's get started. Contract formation. Contracts need to have five essential elements. You need to have an offer, you need to have acceptance, you need to have consideration, intention to create legal relations, that's a bit of a and we'll defrace and you need to have capacity and what I'm going to do now is to look at each of those in turn and give you a feel for what those essential components are all about now you may be working on a, a variety of different sorts of projects some will have contracts in place and some won't and the contracts that you have in place are the ones where you know that there's a signed document that you can go and have a look at or perhaps you've been given it and hopefully if you haven't been given it you know where to go and find it and after this series um, uh, after this session rather you will go and ask for it or you will go and find it in whatever depository it's in because without any one of these five items we don't have a contract in law and that puts the parties into a difficult position um, it's perfectly acceptable to have some sort of an arrangement which isn't a contract in law but again we're talking here about uncertainty in that relationship what is then the basis on which we're doing this work and this project together okay. one of the most obvious uncertainties is that there's no proper basis for payment um, and if that is the case and you can't agree how much each uh, party is going to contribute to the to the project or how much um, is going to be paid for a particular work or service then you're going to be in the hands of the court now the court is brilliant insofar as it's the final arbiter of any legal problem so you've got that comfort and that backstop that the court will do that but nobody wants to go running off to court to go and find out how much their job is worth um, or, or how much they ought to be paying um, for the work in hand um, 
So that uncertainty is one of those really obvious areas where project managers can pitch in and um, uh, have, a, have a good idea as to how um, that contract is meant to be running. So let's have a look at offer. What's offer all about? What does it mean? Well, if you're working under a signed contract, then you don't need to unpick these five areas. Um, what you're going to need to focus on instead as a project manager is what are the terms that you're working under? Do I understand what it is that I am supposed to do in my role as a project manager on this project under this contract? So not what I think I need to do, what I did last time, what I'm used to doing, what the um, what the box says in terms of you know sort of general project manager duties. But on this contract, on this project right now, what am I supposed to be doing? It's a two-step process, and if you've got a signed project, um, a signed contract, then you will be able to skip these next couple of stages and have to concentrate instead what's going to come next in the webinar. But if you are working, as so many projects do, on, um, on a, in a situation where there is no document that you can point to that people have signed to say, this is the contract in place between us, then you're going to need to unpick all of these elements in order to understand what's what. And project managers are in a really good um, and useful and important position to be able to contribute something to that question. And that's why I want to look at um, all five of the components with you in this webinar today. So an offer um, has to be clearly an offer. What that means is um, it has to be something which contains terms which are capable of acceptance. And being capable of acceptance in legal terms means that those terms are clear. Can we identify, in other words, what is being offered? Pretty fundamental stuff, and it's very difficult sometimes to be able to pinpoint what those specific things are. Can you list them out? Do we have uh, a clear understanding of what those things are? One of the ways in which offers get um, uh, become quite challenging to work out is that we have also in law this idea uh, or this uh, device called an invitation to treat. Uh, and an invitation to treat isn't an offer. Um, it's something which masquerades as an offer, and it's something which could potentially uh, convert into an offer if other steps are taken. And an invitation to treat is a request to enter into negotiations. So you might know them as ITPs, um, ITRs, other acronyms are available. There's one, RFP, or an advertisement. That is called an invitation to treat. It isn't an offer of itself because we don't have any terms which are capable of acceptance. It is the starting point for what could become later on an offer. And it's really important to be able to make an offer because you can't go any further if you don't have one. Okay, So if you're just at invitation to treat stage, if you're advertising for people, if you're going out to tender and you're involved in that as a project manager, then you're, you're at sort of pre-offer stages. So let's assume that we have an offer. Where do we go next? Well, the next stage is called acceptance. And acceptance has to be a clear acceptance of an offer, meaning all the things that I've just said. And that acceptance must be clear. Uh, and again, it is often complicated and made more challenging to work out what an acceptance is because we have another legal device. And they're all quite... Um, they will quite, have quite interesting names, these ones. This one's called Battle of the Forms. And um, it comes from a very old piece of case law. Um, but what in essence it means that, you'll see this commonly, I'm sure, uh, on the bottom of um, somebody's email, um, it will say, you know, all work is done subject to our T's and C's and you are deemed to accept them when you reply to this email and now all those sorts of things. Um, but the question then becomes, whose T's and C's apply? Because we don't have an offer. We may have something called an invitation to treat. Can we get to acceptance or not? And in the meantime, we have these, this battle, literally, um, of emails going backwards and forwards. And each time the email comes in and goes out, um, somebody's T's and C's are sort of the, the, the ones on the top of the pile. And who's got the trump card at the end? Um, well, that can be pretty difficult to unpick. And all of these difficulties lend us then and drive us towards actually entering into a document that you can say, this is the contract. 
Battle of forms is particularly difficult where you have part acceptance of terms. So you get this at tender stages as well, don't you? You get toing and froing of work. Uh, yeah, we'll do that, but here's our caveat to that. Here's our list of assumptions. Um, and it's all based on the fact that the contract price is going to change or not going to change, or we can have an LAD free holiday or whatever the thing is. Um, but there is part acceptance of some of the terms and then you've got to work out which ones are accepted and which ones are not. And where do you stand in relation to being on either of those pathways? So there's quite a few challenges with putting the contracts together. Good place to start with that is, well, what would a court say? Because as I mentioned before, the court is the ultimate arbiter of any question of law. Um, in the construction industry, we have, as many of you will know, if you're from those uh, from that industry, we have um, statutory adjudication. So you can go off to your specialist tribunal and get a pretty short, sharp, cheap and cheerful answer to what that question is. But ultimately, the court will be the one to give that final determination. And the court's approach generally, which is quite helpful, the court's getting more and more um, practical and purposeful um, without becoming commercial and avoiding law entirely. Uh, and I quite like the balance of it, and that's how we work here. And the court will try to find a contract if it can. Okay, the court will look at all of these questions, look at all of these challenges, and try to plot a way through the chronology of what's happened and of people's stories about, well, we were doing this, we were doing that, somebody accepted this, somebody approved that, and they'll hear that story and the court or the adjudicator will piece that together. So generally you're finding an increasingly purposive approach from the court which is quite helpful uh, and something I'm most definitely in favour of. So what's the lesson from this? Well acceptance is difficult so can you map out what your obligations are as a project manager? Do we know in essence what we're going to be doing? Um, do we understand where we stand on any question? And also, importantly, are there any uncertainties? What can I add to that conversation as a project manager to say, well, look, you know, you're putting me in charge of this. I'm going to be managing this project. Um, there are these things which are unclear or uncertain or which I simply don't understand, or perhaps I don't have the documents for. Could you pass me these drawings, please? Because clearly I'm going to have to um, work with people and, and lead people to to a place where the project starts to deliver. So you can start to see why project managers and contracts um, ought to be friends with each other. Comparing multiple offers is another challenge which um, we, we get to at this acceptance stage. Again, it's about having different offers on the table. Whose is the last one on the top? What does it say? And do we have acceptance of that one or of something else? How can we mitigate that risk? Well, you can use a really simple phrase. Um, be careful using it, of course, as a, as a, as a non-legal sort of legal practitioner, but be aware that if you put the word subject to contract on the top, what that means is unless and until an agreement is made in a formal sense, um, all of these things uh, are up for grabs. So you can start to help yourself as a project manager a little bit by being aware of this offer acceptance battle. Um, and using the words subject to contract where it would be appropriate to do so. So if you're not sure whether you want to make the arrangement um, or whether in fact you, you are able to make the arrangement as the project manager, you can use those words to mitigate those risks. So I hope some really sort of practical um, uh, suggestions there as to how to deal with it. Right, what's our third element? Our third element is something called consideration, which you might have heard of. Consideration is all about money or money's worth, so non-pecuniary, non-financial value, generally for services and works that have been done. Um, what's consideration all about? Well, it's all about how do we recompense uh, one party for doing work, okay? So this is right at the heart of the buy-sell relationship between a client and its contractor, consultant, whoever it's going to be, the seller and the buyer. So what I've done here is put together a short checklist for you, which I hope will be helpful to looking at the question of consideration and working out whether you think that you are satisfied with how the consideration part of the contract is going to work. Um, so first thing I suggest you look at is what is the payment mechanism? 
what is the basis for calculating the sums due? Uh, either that I'm going to have to assess and ask the client to pay out on, or whether I'm going to be making the application for payment and then um, putting that forward to be assessed. So have a look at it from both angles and make sure that you're clear about what the payment mechanism is that's going to be used. How am I going to um, be working with that? Then you want to be having a look at the payment procedure itself. Does the contract have one? Does it tell you the steps to go through in order to work out what money is due? Yeah. When does it have to be done? What is the method by which those calculations or those assessments um, are done? How do we measure what money should be flowing between any of the parties? Are there any conditions to payment at all? For example, um, there may be terms of the contract that ask the party who is applying for money to provide some sort of security. Uh, it may be something like a collateral warranty or a guarantee or a series of documents to prove that certain parts have been delivered or there is kit on site or something of that nature. In some contracts now, you're also finding uh, preconditions to payment being um, a proper program of work. So one where both of the parties can see exactly what's going to happen when and what the intend um, progress of the project is going to be. So have a look and see if there are any conditions that attach. Here's a tricky one. Are there any amendments to standard forms? Well, that is particularly difficult because almost certainly if you're dealing with a signed contract or a contract that's intended to be signed, the answer to that is going to be yes. There are very few vanilla contracts that are signed these days. Uh, pros and cons to that for sure. Uh, that's, today is not a day to debate whether we like Z clauses in NEC contracts or special conditions and uh, additional con conditions of contract in JCT, FIDIC or any other form of contracts that you may come across. I raise it simply as a flag because payment is one of those areas where amendments are made and it's a good idea just to make sure that you have a specific look as the project manager at whether there are payment amendments from the standard forms. And the reason for that is a pretty simple one. It's all about compliance with regulation because the Housing Grant Construction Regeneration Act, for example, in the construction sector, um, is one that that requires minimum standards for payment um, terms uh, between parties. So if your minimum payment terms, which are automatically reflected in your standard forms of contract, because they are published for the world to use, if there are amendments to those, then they may fall foul of what the underlying law is. And as I said before, law will give you the ultimate answer to any question you have to, um, you have to uh, need the answer to. So there's a question as to compliance there. And then additional codes, um, uh, which are in industry, some uh, will be uh, mandatory, some will be uh, optional codes, depending on what kind of contract you have, what size of the business um, you are, and what size your uh, opponent or your uh, contracting party is. So have a look at all of those things. Question there about supply chain for project managers, just to have a think about how you're going to flow some of those things down and across the supply chain. Can you do it? Is it possible? And what's the implication on cash flow going in and out? Especially things like requirements for um, preconditions to payment, how is that going to be affected? Because then ultimately as a project manager being the sort of central piece to the delivery, um, you're going to need to have a good handle on how all parts of the contract chain are going to be able to work. And I've mentioned there a need to comply with regulation. All right, here's our last, uh, no, our second to last. It's our fourth one is intention. So this slightly unwieldy phrase of intention to create legal relations, what's that all about? Well, it's a statement of intention. Um, why are we coming into doing this contract together? Um, it's a pretty simple statement. Um, I've broken it down um, for you uh, a bit like I did with the consideration one. Um, a little mini checklist here to make sure that you set out and um, you won't be writing this as such, it'll be somebody like me writing it or perhaps a, um, a procurement department person. Um, 
but you're going to be looking for these things as a project manager. What is the background to the project? The legal terminology is called recitals. Um, but you know, in this intention to create bit, you need to just set out and look for why the parties are making the contract. So we need to set out what the project's all about. This is a project to do X, Y, and Z. And then you need to set out what each party is bringing to the project. So why are we two parties, assuming it's one buy and one sell, what are we bringing to the project? So there's a couple of examples there. X owns the land and wishes to buy, uh, wishes to build a 100 meter tall skyscraper. Okay, so we've got a landowner who's got a, a vision there. And the counterparty, which is why we're entering into the contract, is and why is an experienced skyscraper constructor? And that's obviously very simply put purposefully to this, but you ought to be able to identify as a project manager those um, specific, uh, very simple roles as to what each party is bringing to the project. Okay, then you need to be looking for a joint statement, yeah, and the parties want to. Um, enter into this contract together or something like that and by the signatures at the bottom of this contract we agree to do this contract together okay so you're looking for that joint statement as well my advice to you is to have it drafted simply but properly um, as project managers you're not looking to um, you know to do that yourselves necessarily but you are going to be wanting to be able to identify those different things okay it's all about scene setting it doesn't set obligations as such none of this is about an obligation um, it is a statement of intention okay and finally uh, and this is a pretty simple one so you'll all get the hang of this uh, quickly I'm sure it's something called capacity capacity means a legal ability to enter into a contract now capacity is not usually a problem in commercial contracts it's usually something which attaches to uh, personal contracts um, on, in a mental wellness state of being. But for commercial contracts, your legal ability to, to, to enter into a contract depends on having somebody sign it. And that's, of course, because your, um, your non-human entity, your organization, needs to have a human who can sign on its behalf. So my advice to you as project managers is to just get comfortable with the capacity question um, and sometimes this is offered up and sometimes it isn't. One organization I worked for was very proactive on making sure that this was done uh, and they sought it in return from their counterparty and other organizations I've worked for have just um, made an assumption that whoever has signed the contract does have that authority to do that. But I think the world has changed since that position um, was commonly taken. So my advice to project managers now is to satisfy yourselves that you do have um, uh, a signatory who has that authority on behalf of the organization. That ought to be something which is catered for quite um, easily within large organizations. It's maybe something within systems um, that you can, only certain people can access it in order to sign it and then move to the next gateway, that sort of thing. Um, but in smaller companies, you may find that it is just um, a printed out page with a, 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 a wet signature on it, a real signature in other words, and then there's a scan that comes back to you. So do just take care to take a moment to do that properly as well. So what does this all mean um, for, for project managers? Well, it means a real understanding of where that uncertainty in the relationship can lie. And when you're the project manager sitting between those parties to the contract, I want you to have as little uncertainty as possible, as little discomfort as possible about what the parameters of that relationship are. Now, there's a few easy ways to fix that. And one of them, of course, is to go through those five steps that have been done. Uh, and the second is to get somebody else to do all of those five steps and then make sure that um, you see the final um, fifth step in action. Uh, and another way to do it is to get involved um, or to suggest perhaps to those you're working with that they use a device called a letter of intent. Now, um, a letter of intent, commonly known as an LOI, um, what's the point of that? Why don't we just go into contract? Well, letters of intent are really useful because they can get you started on whatever work you want to do to procure but without waiting for contract negotiations to conclude. They are easy to do. 
and they are quick and cheap to set up. So there's lots of pluses with letters of intent. Now, there are some risks attached to them, of course. Nothing is that um, one-way street in life. Um, and the risk of using a letter of intent is that a contract is never actually into, entered into. Um, the LOI then expires, um, but works continue. So both parties are then at risk and that uncertainty, the uncertainty in the relationship exists as well because the person keeps giving the work, and the payment keeps being made, but we don't really understand what the terms of that relationship are. So letters of intent have this hugely um, <coughs> commercially driven, purposeful approach, but they do have that big risk attached to them, um, may, namely that they just get forgotten and um, people continue with the work, uh, not knowing then what the arrangement in place is. So there's a couple of ways to fix those risks. Good for project managers to look out for, um, and if you're given a letter of intent and said, right, we're going to get X and Y on board, you know, we've got this letter of intent, do have a quick look at them and see if there are clear statements on these items. A limitation in time is the first one to look for. So how long is this LOI going to last for? Does it have a stated expiry date um, or does it have a point at which um, the, it's going to terminate or automatically come to an end? So how long are you going to be working with it, in other words? Dealing with time, now dealing with money, then um, <clears throat> what sort of numbers are we talking about that are going to be bound within this letter of intent? Yeah, Is there a limitation on what's going to be payable? Is there an authority to spend money in there that the uh, contractor or the consultant is going to um, be allowed to uh, incur and therefore seek reimbursement for. So as a project manager, you're going to need to have a good handle on how much am I likely to be uh, to be faced with in terms of assessing um, applications for payment. What are the terms on which um, that work is going to be done, on which the time is going to be spent and on which the, uh, the money is going to be incurred? Well, the easiest way to sort that um, is to just refer to what the planned form of contract is going to be. So, you know, in other words, when this letter of intent expires or when this money has been spent, then the parties will move into the contract space. Or once the contract negotiations have concluded, because of course you're using the letter of intent to, um, so that you don't have to wait um, for that toing and froing to finish. So it's a good sort of interim device to use. So um, the, the risk can be mitigated by um, just simply saying that we plan to enter into a form of contract called whatever it happens to be. Okay, just put the name of the contract in there. So as I've said there, very useful device for sure. A really good way and quick and cheap way to get um, works and services started. But just be aware of what those limitations should be. And when you get towards the end of them, you don't let things drift and then you move into the contract space. Now, terms of contract. Um, we've got it set up, we've got our five components, but what are the rights and duties? What are the obligations? What are the promises that everybody is going to be working under? Well, <clears throat> this is worthy of a whole um, webinar in itself, frankly, and definitely I spent several lectures at law school learning about express and implied terms. But just to give you an overview for the point of today, um, terms of contract are often called clauses. They can be express and implied. Express means that they are written down and um, then form part of the agreement. Implied means that they are not written down, um, but they will be, uh, that there may be circumstances in which those terms come into the contract, even though they're not stated. What's the risk of that? Well, the risk is invisibility of implied terms. Okay, do we know what the terms of the contract are we're working under? Well, we don't if we can't see some of them. Um, here's some examples. Um, invisible implied terms are often negative. For example, don't break the law. You don't have to write that in a contract. That is part and parcel of um, the legal system that we work with. So if you have that written into your contract, 
fine, it's an express term. But if it isn't written to the contract, it's part of the underlying law anyway. And you should know that you shouldn't break the law. Um, other invisible terms can in fact be positive. Okay, is a really common one here, which um, many people forget. In fact, I was only advising on, on it yesterday. Um, contractor has a reasonable time to fix a defect before the employer can call a third party. So <clears throat> I had uh, uh, received uh, questions about this after last time's webinar, and I wonder whether there will be questions about it again. The people say, oh my God, I didn't realize that. Um, I, I've been told by my client that if I don't come back, they're going to get somebody else in or worse, the one I was advising on yesterday, I've just been told that um, because I didn't come back within 24 hours, which by the way wasn't in the contract, um, somebody else is coming in and I'm going to be charged or deducted or retention is going to be used, you know, this much money. So <clears throat> that is a legal right that contractors have. It doesn't have to be written into contracts. Um, it's an invisible implied term. You might find it written in because the concept of reasonableness is a difficult one. So you might want to add some precision to that. Um, and there may be different time periods for fixing defects depending on um, how urgent they are, how much they affect the operation or the use of the asset or the facility. Uh, and therefore, you might not want to leave it to chance to use the word reasonable. But nonetheless, the principle is the same, which is, um, that this right for contractors exists. So we have positive, invisible, implied terms as well. So there's that legal test, lays that legal test um, of reasonableness there. The real issue with the invisibility is you don't know where you stand. Um, and we come right back to this uncertainty of relationship question. Um, you don't know until there comes a point when you have to know. And unfortunately, you have to know when you have a dispute. And we don't want to be uh, having parties in those situations uh, and therefore not really knowing where they stand uh, until um, you know until there's a really challenging time as between the parties. I want you to be knowledgeable before then so that you can f have foresight as to these things and so that you know if and when a dispute does arise you're very clear as to what your uh, part in that contract is uh, uh, and what the extent of those uh, terms are. So I hope that's helpful as well. So general sort of piece of advice uh, for project managers, minimise the use of implied terms, but don't make your contracts too lengthy. And I wrote an extra note on, on my slides here this morning saying, um, just to explain that sometimes lengthy contracts are done for the reason of avoiding invisibility. And sometimes that's why lawyers will draft more terms or whether you think your contracts are a bit wordy or difficult to read and that is a typical belt and braces approach from um, people who are trained in risk um, not project of course but legal and corporate risk um, it's not my personal approach um, my personal approach is to explore those invisibility pieces and to look to see whether we need to, in fact, make those uh, visible and express terms. And if we don't, then we will leave them to uh, do their thing. Let me just switch that down. Okay, so why does, oh, I don't know why that has moved again. Legal frameworks. So legal frameworks for project managers are going to help you to do your job better. Why? Because in every jurisdiction, law is a straitjacket. And anybody who's heard me talk before will know about um, this phrase that I like to use. It's all about um, a framework for lawful behaviour and the mandating of boundaries for dealings in what is otherwise, in the UK, a free market. Dealings, of course, includes contracts and terms of contracts. And from your perspective as APM members, um, the law underpins your professional association as well. So it gives you comfort and faith, and law being the ultimate arbiter of any issues, um, you can have um, the comfort that your professional association 
will be dealing with things according to law. Now, I'm not going to go over this whole site because it is really big and that is deliberate. Um, jurisprudence in the UK, jurisprudence, legal history and the incremental um, development of law um, relates to all of these things. So if I just tell you that we start with contract and tort, we supplement the law with codification, which is all different types of statutes and, and acts of parliament. Um, on top of that, we then layer regulations, um, we lay, layer <clears throat> items of compliance. Uh, we still have EU law in there, notwithstanding Brexit. Um, throw in some codes of practice for some people, maybe optional for others, maybe mandatory. And then on top of that, you have the bolstering of all of that um, of case law. Uh, and judgments of the courts and, and the devolved uh, tribunals. So the message from this slide is really just to say, wow, it's so complicated, and it is. Um, and what's more, it's ever-changing. Uh, and this is why it's really important to take legal advice, is to try and keep on top of what that ever-changing position is. Even if you're using your contract as the basis for your relationship, there are lots of other things on top of that which add to it. But what it means is in the UK, we have a really rich um, legal history. It's something to be proud of. There's lots of information on the internet you can read about. Um, and for project managers, it means that we have this core freedom of contract um, uh, and the boundaries of that, um, which are going to be important to your jobs. So on that setting, um, we're talking then about powers and duties. What do you understand you have to do as the project manager? What does your contract say? And if you don't have a contract, have we worked out what the, the nub of this relationship is going to be about? And what do you have to do? I've given you there a few examples. Uh, hopefully some of those are familiar. Perhaps all of them are and you're thinking, crikey, I've got to do all of this stuff. And yeah, you'd be right. You do have to do all of that stuff to a greater or lesser extent, depending on the contract and depending on the contract type relationship that you're going to be working with. I'll leave you with a little takeaway on that point um, to think about as, uh, as you perhaps consider this in the context of the various projects that you're working on. What do you think you can bring to any conversations about project contracts, whether you've got them now, whether they're going to be prospective, whether it's one that you're not sure about? Okay, so there's a, a thought bubble there to take away. Just getting... Um, <clears throat> I want to make sure that we have some time for some questions as well. Um, just important to tell you that um, as a project manager, it's not your responsibility to get the contract right. That's someone else's responsibility. But as the project manager and that central piece to the contract, uh, to the relationships and then to the delivery, it really is incumbent on you. So I say you can and you should um, ask questions if things don't look right. Okay, and hopefully from this webinar, you're going to get some ideas as to what doesn't look right and the kind of things to go looking for. And again, we come back to that item um, of risk and uncertainty. Risk to the contract uh, and the project itself, and also risk to you as a professional and to your organization. And this is not to scaremonger at all. This is all real stuff, which um, unfortunately um, uh, for some project managers, I have to support them in day to day. I wonder if we've got one more there. There we go. Um, <coughs> that's not a checklist as such, but that is some examples of the type of difficulties that project managers can get into if they don't understand the very basics of contracts, which is why we're bringing this webinar series to APM members as well. So one of the things that our SIG focuses on an awful lot is about helping project managers deal with the contracts that they need to work with. Finally, I want to bring you a note on good faith, because good faith is something that we talk about all the time. Um, it has a specific legal meaning. Uh, it may or may not be in your contract, um, and you can certainly be uh, accused of not acting in good faith, um, almost the drop of a hat as a project manager, because you are brokering those relations between uh, various contracting parties and up and down and around the supply chain as well. Let's throw in some stakeholders, neighbors, agencies, and other, so other forms of organizations. And uh, you can see why you know, my, my passion is for uh, enabling project managers to do their jobs properly. 
So good faith is not part of the U UK legal framework as such. There is no obligation, unlike in other jurisdictions, some of them write it down and they have it codified, um, except in some special cases. So not all contracts are the same in that regard. Um, however, that said, uh, we cannot ignore good faith. And so if you do have contract clauses that require you to act in good faith, or something that looks like it might be good faith, such as collaboration. Okay, so everybody's talking about collaborative contracts um, in the construction industry. The most uh, well-known collaborative contract is the NEC contract, at least as it's written. That's what's meant to happen. Um, and there are other contracts too that have um, optional clauses on collaboration, such as in JCT, which is traditionally a contract that people say, ah, well, it's not a collaborative at all. We like NEC, we're going to do that. And today's not a day to compare those two forms of contract, not least because our membership is not just from the construction industry, but from much wider industries as well. And I know that we have lots of PNs who are from IT and banking and financial and lots of other sectors as well. So the court's going to look at contract clauses that you have that have good faith in them or something that looks like them. And it will give that purposive approach if it can. But in the absence of those types of clauses, there is no requirement on any party to act in good faith. What there is, is an implied term not to act in bad faith. And bad faith is quite easy to um, establish because it looks like um, dishonesty, it looks like bad behaviour, um, it looks like being underhand, it looks things like that. Um, to counter that, we now are finding more and more commonly contract clauses that require positive and proactive good faith type obligations and the court will look at them and read them and uh, give them the correct weight. Now, I mentioned that we do have some special cases in UK law that do require good faith. And your question as a project manager is, is this in your project structure? Because some of them employ it. Insurance contracts, partnerships and, oops, partnerships and trusts. So those are sort of the two key areas in which um, you may go looking for uh, contracts in your project structure. And those contracts will have in them one of these invisible terms, and it may also state expressly that the parties have to act in good faith. And that means an extra layer of obligations on the parties who are, um, uh, are part of that, that contract and who have entered into that contract. So this is a whistle-stop tour of webinar one, which is contracts, what are they all about? Uh, and I hope I have given you in this uh, a really good sense of what contracts are all about and of all the things to go looking for. Remember, you can't undo risks once you have signed a contract. So as a project manager, if you are able to raise your voice and have a seat at the table of discussions and contract negotiations, then you're going to be doing the best job you can uh, to try to get that contract into a really good shape or that arrangement if it's not going to be a contract um, before everybody gets stuck in. Otherwise, the relationship is at risk and the parties don't really know the basis on which they are talking together. So as a summary, and then um, questions and the like, um, not all contracts are the same as we've just seen. Do you have a contract, do you have an LOI, or do you have something else? Is the arrangement set up properly? If it isn't, then what are you going to do? Do we have those five components? If they're not written down, then what do we have? Can we find them ourselves? Or do we have to go looking for them and sort of back engineer it and piece it together. As a project manager then, how do I know what I'm working to? What are my duties and my rights and my responsibilities going to be? When am I going to have to do them? And is it stated somewhere how I'm going to have to do them? For example, the dissemination of information. So it really is incumbent on you guys as project managers to get a decent grip on contracts. And I'm hoping that this has been a good starting point for you to do that. Um, our next webinar is all go is going to be about building that contract. So we're going to look at some of the parts of the contract that you're going to need to be familiar with as project managers. And if you can't find them in your contract, then how to deal with um, their lack of presence. Thereafter, we'll have webinar three, which is 
what do you do as a project manager when things go wrong or unexpected stuff happens? So again, giving you some more tools as to how to deal with challenges as between the parties to the contracts. I very much hope you can join us. We have some feedback and we can now go to some questions. Just a reminder that um, the contract and procurement SIG, um, we like to do as much as we can to help APM members in that sphere uh, on both contracts and procurement. So please do get in touch with us. Uh, my contact details at the end of this as well. And we love to hear from APM members and support them in their endeavors. Thank you, Sarah. So really, if we go straight into some questions, because there's quite a few. Right, so okay, kicking okay. off, Sarah, how does an LOI differ from an MOU? Right, an MOU is an acronym for Memorandum of Understanding. And what that is, is a very focused agreement um, which sets out literally the understanding between the parties about their ideas for working together in the future. And it's typically used to convey and to allow access to confidential information. For example, um, we would like to work with you in the future. You may be a future supplier to us. Um, these are the kind of uh, areas of work and this is what we earn from these types of work. Uh, and therefore, allowing somebody to have access to a, a list of names or to um, uh, amounts of money would otherwise be um, a commercially confidential piece of information. So to allow someone to have access to it or to read it or simply to know it up here, um, you need to enter into a memorandum of understanding. The LOI by contrast is a type of an arrangement whereby work is actually done. So the MOU doesn't do work itself. The MOU sets in place the ability for confidential information to be shared. It doesn't actually enable work to be done. I hope that answers the um, the, the person you. who raised its question. Pleasure. Thanks, Dara. Thank you. Um, so next question is: What does reasonable time mean? Can be different for? Can it be different? For so I think, can it be different for different projects or things? That's a really good question. And that is exactly the reason why we try not to use the concept of reasonableness if we can. So when I say we, I mean me and my business. Uh, and the answer, very simple answer to that is reasonableness is different in every single case. There are parameters around reasonableness and I can give you some ideas as to the factors that would be taken into account as to reasonableness. Um, but the court's question will be, well, what is reasonable in the situation in which this dispute arises or in which this defect was or wasn't done and therefore somebody is complaining about it? Um, reasonableness is different every single time and that is because the facts are different every single time. Because the facts are different every single time, it makes it very difficult to use the idea of reasonableness without allowing for that uncertainty to remain. Now, we can probably pinpoint what is unreasonable. Okay, so a reasonable time to correct a defect would not be several years. Okay, and it's unlikely to be several months, but it may be longer than a few days. It will depend on the parameters and the exact circumstances and all the facts of that particular case. If somebody is wondering out there whether um, the, the the, the contract that they have um, has that term in it or, or whether that term is going to be effective, then um, if they drop me a note, I'll happily have a quick look at um, the phrase that they're trying to get to grips with. Um, but then there are no hard and fast rules about reasonableness other than it is all the things that you would take into account to assess whether it's reasonable or not. So all the facts, who who's around at the time, what kind of a defect is this? How does it affect the asset or the facility? Um, how much is it going to cost? Um, what kind of logistics are we going to have to put in place? And things like that. Um, and uh, as well as those positive things, we're also looking at the negative of what would be unreasonable, for example, that very long period of time. The minefield by the sounds of it, Sarah. It, it is. is. <laughs> Reasonableness is a real minefield. You've just you hit the nail on the head there. 
try and avoid it if you can. It's normally um, a cop out. Yeah. <laughs> next question. What if a contract is drawn in another country and that is not recognised, i.e. China CCP government will not recognise intellectual property of UK law? Well, the basis for that, the basis for answering that question is what is the law of the country? Uh, sorry, what is the law of the contract that has been entered into? If you have a, a contract which is entered into under Chinese law, then any question or dispute will be determined by whatever Chinese law says. And if Chinese law is saying that they don't recognize an entity, then that cannot be a valid contract under Chinese law. If, however, you are entering into a contract which um, may be even written in Chinese, maybe have Chinese parties in it, but the relevant clause, and this is where you have to go looking for these things, the relevant clause says any disputes will be decided under English law, then hey presto, you then go to English jurisprudence to find out the answer. So first, first question for whoever, whoever has answered that is, try to work out, go and have a look for what is the law of the contract and that will give you the first hurdle to then where to go after that. Brilliant, great, thank you. Um, we are at 1.30, but I think if we just have one more question and then just to let everyone know, because there are a number of questions here and they're all great questions. So these will be fed back to Sarah and she will be able to provide those um, in response and we'll, we'll share those along with the other content that from today. But for our last question today, um, any sight on the future of contracts in project management? Um, current hmm. contract method practice is too tedious. <laughs> that's someone who's got some tricky contracts up their sleeve I'm sure um, well really interestingly there are no particular forms or association forms uh, standard forms in industry for project managers to deal with and that is actually a really insightful question because to my mind it's one of the areas that we could improve on uh, in our uh, understanding of how project managers work and trying to again work out what is this we are supposed to be doing because the field of project management is so wide and so varied um, and you know it is like pinning jelly to a wall um, so um, there are none on the horizon that I am aware of and I like to think fingers crossed that I'm fairly close to these things um, obviously, APM has its way of doing stuff and there are plenty of guidelines and um, pro formas and all of that sort of thing out there. Um, I suppose I'm obliged to say other organisations also have their own versions um, and um, I do work with some uh, other project management organisations as well. Um, but nobody has come up with like a, a sort of worldwide contract for project managers. Um, you know, I, I would be welcome to the challenge in some ways. Um, I do have forms that I use um, here for project managers that um, want to be proactive in going to their clients, perhaps they're self-employed people or, or small um, sort of PM specialists, uh, and they have their own sets of T's and C's and that, and, and we help them to put those together. Um, but generally speaking, I'm finding that project managers are being asked to sign forms of contract which are um, consultancy forms of contract, uh, and those need quite a bit of work doing to them in order to make them um, fit for purpose, um, because you're not delivering traditional services like an engineer or an architect um, or a software developer or somebody like that would be doing. Your, your services, as we've seen, and as I'm sure you know from your, your jobs yourselves, are really wide ranging. Um, and to that extent can encompass all sorts of things that may be said or unsaid. And therefore bringing that back to what is the scope of services for a project manager is a really important exercise to do. So the short answer to that is, it's a brilliant question. I'm glad it's been asked. There are no standard forms out there for project managers to use. The risk in that therefore leads you to be proactive as a project manager to set out your stall as to what you can do what you feel you're capable of, what your organisation can offer. And of course, in the background, um, and, and, and I teach on this, um, is a question of insurance, um, particularly in the professional indemnity field. What happens if this thing goes wrong? Could I be um, you know, subject to scrutiny or, or vulnerable to criticism or something like that? So um, taking that proactive approach and writing your own scope of services is something that we can help with. Um, and I think it's a really good and proactive step for project managers to take.
a great note to end on actually um, about great. being proactive as a project manager so sounds like it resonated yeah. well. Thank you. So it just leaves me to say thank you very much for your time today and to everyone for joining. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great afternoon and we'll see you soon. Take care. Great to see everybody. Bye-bye.